Thank you, Diane, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For the last time, at least uh, for this conference, uh, I have, as I said, been here for a half an hour. Uh, going through written questions is a huge torrent. The ones on the floor I didn't even get to open. Uh, and I've divided the rest into three general categories off the top of my head without one moment to appraise it, just by the first few words. General philosophy, the fact value issue, and everything that pertains to that, and then that which could be classified in some general terms as more personal. So I'm going to follow that order uh, and give about the first half hour to general philosophy. So if you're straining at the bit on either of the other categories, wait. <laughs> Your time will come. Uh, nothing about the fact value or more personal things. Let's start with general philosophy. And I'll try to, um, I already have, even counting the questions that I have thro thrown out as being too specialized or too long to read, way more than I could possibly even give a yes or no answer to in 90 minutes. So um, I've had no chance to even organize within categories. Uh, so this has no structure beyond you know, people ask questions and they came in a certain juxtaposition and that's where the answers are. I'm going to try to start on a few written ones with the idea that someone should be rewarded for having gotten here early. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to go to uh, oral and Diane is going to remind me, what well, we said at 2 o'clock, make it at 10 after 2 to switch over to the next category. I'll try to be as brief on the idea that a lot of poor answers are better than a few long answers that are good. <laughs> <clears throat> Please define moralizing. Moralizing is a misuse of the process of moral judgment in the same way that rationalizing is a misuse of the process of reason. And moralizing in particular is the passing of inappropriate moral judgment by means of applying a dogma out of context. It differ, differs from proper moral judgment in that a proper moral judgment, first of all, the principle itself is objective, and secondly, it's applied within a context so that you take into account all the relevant uh, circumstances. I'm going by the question as asked. It didn't say give an example, so I'm not. Is it ethically wrong to buy the product of a Western firm which is produced wholly or in part in a communist country if that product is better and priced equally to anything produced in the West? Yes, I would say it is. Uh, the communists are our mortal foes and uh, any, any uh, economic trade with them is a sanction of uh, an aggressive enemy which despite Glasnost and perestroika and the latest, the technical term for it is BS. I understand that was discussed at a lecture uh, yesterday in a more theoretical vein by uh, <laughs> Mr. Schwartz. Despite all that, nothing has changed and uh, therefore it is certainly morally wrong uh, to help uh, uh, the communists uh, by trade. Now, in the context, you see how these are all mixed up. In the context of Ms. Rand's definition of art and her statement that art, uh, I can't read it, does something to, oh, converts man's metaphysical abstractions into the equivalent of concretes, into specific entities open to man's direct perception. Would a painting or a sculpture that does not resemble a concrete in reality, i.e. a painting which is solid red or so-called free-form sculpture be considered art. No, it would not be. It is not even bad art. It is anti-art. Art is a recreation of reality. There's room for a great deal of option in the artist's philosophy 
and in the techniques he uses, even in the school of art that he belongs to. But as soon as he leaves reality as such and gives you just a disintegrated smear of sensation, uh, an unintelligible shape, such as a so-called free-form sculpture or a spread of red, he is outside the field of art entirely. And uh, I, just in going through the chapter on art, which I'm about to do, I went through some notes from Ms. Rand that I took in discussions, and she said emphatically, do not classify modern art as subjectivism in the theory of art. That's giving it too great a compliment. So-called non-objective art is not the application of a false philosophic theory to art. It is not art, period. And in fact, she technically calls it junk, if I remember in one of her articles. Uh, there is a concerted... Oh, I'm supposed to go to oral questions. All right. Now, if you follow my guidelines, who has an oral question? That is to say, one that you express in words. Yes. Yes, I didn't have time to... Um, now, don't read a long one, though. It's not long. Uh, now that we've discussed and I th the ill state of affairs that have been brought out in this conference, and I, I'm very grateful and, and I'm glad I came here. Now, what is your outline, if any, for any political action since politics is the implementation? What is my outline, if any, for any political action? On my own part, zero. If you mean on the part of objectivists in general, only where they see room for some kind of appropriate action. There's nothing whatever wrong with joining a reputable political party, from which I obviously exclude libertarianism and communism, but Republicans or Democrats, uh, which are interchangeable basically, and trying to fight from within the party for better platform, better candidates. If you have the stomach for it, there's nothing wrong with running for office. Uh, if you can do it with a modicum of integrity, uh, you know, without having to come out blatantly for things with which you disagree. And if you can get yourself elected, more power to you. I mean, you have to have a cast iron stomach and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, but if you know, somebody is eager for action, there's nothing wrong with that, I think it's premature. I think the same time and energy would be better devoted to spreading ideas, because I think it's premature to take political action, but I would never say it's wrong if a person is specifically and concretely, and for good reason, but if you could name a good reason, interested in a specific political action. All right, I'll take another. Yes. Dr. Gottel referred me to you for this question regarding the foundation of the objectivist ethics. How would you answer someone who claims the choice of limited itself an arbitrary mode of commitment? How would I answer the question that the choice to live is itself arbitrary and therefore the whole objectivist ethics is arbitrary? If I say so myself, I've written a spectacular answer to that in chapter 7. Uh, it really, it impressed me after I wrote it. <laughs> and I'll just have to give it to you in very condensed form. The choice to live is the choice to accept reality. The alternative to life is not existing. That is to say, the rejection of the realm of reality. Now, leaving aside legitimate cases of suicide, which we're not here questioning, the choice, therefore, comes down to should I accept reality or should I reject it? You cannot ask is it arbitrary or not because arbitrary is defined in terms of departure from reality. So until a person accepts reality, he can't use the concept arbitrary. It's a stolen concept. That is a, a limp con condensation of a really good passage in chapter 7. Uh, now written, there is a concerted attack on the right of Americans to keep and bear arms. Can you suggest a few brief principles upon which one may base an argument against this movement? Well, isn't it the Second Amendment, the lawyers here, isn't that the... The Second Amendment uh, covers that as a statement. As far as an argument, the basic argument is that every individual in a free country has a right to self-defense. You delegate your right to self-defense in a proper society to the government. But that doesn't mean you strip yourself of it in every and all context. 
There are such things as emergencies where you have to yourself exercise the right because it's simply impossible. If there's a burglar in your home and he's threatening you to call 911, first of all, you're going to get a busy signal. So uh, 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 you retain the primary right of self-defense and the right to bear arms is an aspect of that. Now, over and above that, of course, there are other uses, proper uses of the right to bear arms, most blatantly as a, for recreation in the case of target shooting or uh, uh, hunting, etc. But those are derivative uses. Uh, uh, the primary absolute validation is the right of self-defense which precedes the establishment of government. That's, you asked a brief answer. You know, every question in philosophy you can answer in a telegram or an encyclopedia. And the whole trick in a question pair like this is to do the first. Which virtues would a man not need on a desert island? And if so, why? <laughs> well, that has the uh, virtue of being an original question. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I ever got that before. Running through the list, he certainly needs rationality. He would not need independence as such, because there's nobody there to copy, unless he has the memory of what he learned or books that he carried when he was shipwrecked, in which case he would still have to judge them independently. But if he were somehow born and brought up on a desert island, independence would be inapplicable. Integrity he would still need. He'd have to act according to his principles, and he'd have to hold principles whether he felt like acting according to them or not. Justice he would still need as applied to himself. He couldn't take unearned guilt, have unearned expectations. Productiveness, of course, absolutely in spades, more desperately than anywhere else, because now there's nobody else to help him out. And what else does that leave? Pride? Absolutely. He would have to live up to uh, uh, all the virtues to the fullest of his potential. So the only one that would really be essentially useless would be, if you're entirely out of contact with other men, there's no point having a virtue telling you don't improperly rely on them. All right, and the very back, yes. The other day you mentioned uh, that you weren't able to discuss love in relation to justice. Could you discuss that? Well, I, I, would I discuss love in relation to justice? I didn't mention it because I had, in the chapter that I was reading you from, I had nothing original. It was just a lengthy quotation from Ayn Rand. And uh, uh, her point there is that love is a response to values, that is rational love, not neurotic love, and has to be earned. You cannot expect someone to love you in exchange for nothing, nor can you properly love them in exchange for nothing. Uh, love is, is a form of a just response. It's recognizing the virtues of another person, their values, the importance that they, they have to you, and then responding accordingly. And in that sense, it's an instance of trade. Uh, you get pleasure from the loved one, and your love is like the emotional payment for the pleasure uh, that you get. Uh, now, Ayn Rand herself has discussed this in detail in many contexts. I refer you to her. But I had no uh, particular new point. Uh, uh, love is not my specialization. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that sarcastically. I mean, I never did any study of that. That doesn't mean I didn't practice it, but I didn't study it. <laughs> what is the proper defense for freedom of speech in the Rushdie case? Is the purchase of Rushdie's book, does it sanction the defense of an individual's right to the freedom of speech, or does it sanction Rushdie's ideas? First of all, Rushdie's ideas, however abhorrent, are not the kind that uh, you are engaging in an improper moral sanction to buy. He just has, it's just crummy. I mean, it's, it's low caliber, modern, mystical, uh, you know, symbolic, semi-unintelligible. It's just typical junk. And uh, from that point of view, there's no special sanction if you want to read it uh, on its own or you want to know what people are talking about or you're, you know, you're stranded on the New York subway and you've got two or three hours between stops and that's the only... <laughs> there's many possible reasons which, uh, which uh, would not... You, you don't sanction per se 
the content of every book you write now, if it was a book by Adolf Hitler, and you knew that the money is going to him to further his monstrous work, that's a different proposition. But, uh, but Rushdie is going to spend the rest of his life in hiding the poor guy. Uh, and uh, no matter what happens, uh, his life has been destroyed, so he's paid the supreme penalty. Uh, I would buy the book simply as a defiance of the Ayatollah and of the Iranians. Uh, so in terms of freedom of speech, without question, purchase his book. I was very pleased that it was on the bestseller list for so long. You know, a lot of that was not people making a principled stand, but simply wanting to know what all the fuss was about. You can't beat publicity like that. Uh, and in fact, I've heard it suggested at a literary cocktail party that Rushdie's agent instigated the whole thing. <coughs> But I believe that that is the talk of jealous authors who wish that they were in that position. <laughs> now here it just happens by coincidence to be on Iran right next to Rushdie. Did I understand you correctly that you would favor the wiping of Iran off the face of the earth? Yes, morally I certainly would. That does not mean that it's practically necessary, so if I implied that, let me clarify. I do not think that war is necessary, even in regard to Iran, if we had a foreign policy. Now, Peter, where are you? Did you, you covered this yesterday, I assume, right? What, a, in essence, a proper foreign policy would consist of, so I'm not going to reiterate that, but if the United States stood up to Russia, uh, the whole rest of it would take care of itself, and so would the Iranian situation. The hostages would be freed. Uh, the Lebanese civil war would be over. The whole Mideast would disappear in terms of being a problem. Uh, so long as we are doing business with and approving and endorsing and helping out the main instigator of the disaster and terrorism in the modern world, then of course there is no way out. So I would simply, as a moral reflex, favor bombing Iran because there's no hope of getting a decent policy out of this country, out of the political leadership. Uh, and therefore, rather than nothing, I would say bomb Iran. We've certainly had ample provocation, but it, and it would be completely moral to do it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that is the ideal solution. The ideal solution would be to end the whole world crisis without even dropping a bomb. However, I have nothing against dropping a bomb if the target asks for it. Now, the questioner goes on to say, if so, in other words, given that I would, would you take care to relocate and compensate those Iranians who hadn't initiated any force? Absolutely not. Now, uh, this is a, a much broader point than Iran. There is no such thing as being concerned about the innocent members of an enemy in a wartime situation. No one in his right mind when they were bombing Germany in World War II said, now we've got to have a special court of reparations for the Berliners that got hit by bombs, or the people in Hamburg and Munich, etc., who were against the Nazis for the obvious reason that it is impossible if there was such a thing as a nuclear warhead that you could program kill only evil people. <laughs> okay, great, well, why not use it? But the point is this, you, there's no physical possibility. It's you versus them, and as Ayn Rand pointed out once, one of the penalties that you pay for having a bad government is that you suffer for its acts even if you yourself are entirely innocent. You cannot take the view, for instance, I didn't do anything, I minded my own business, so let, you know, let other people worry about the government and let other people be the subjects of the, of the revenge of others. You have got the responsibility as a citizen to do what you can to make your government decent and if you fail, whether you tried or you didn't try, that it's on your head as much as anybody else's. And that's another reason why you can't just say, I'll live my own life and be a uh, political. There's no such thing as a differentiation between the innocent and the guilty when you are talking about a military situation. And the request, this question concludes, who would pay for wiping out the enemy? 
That's why we have a military budget. The, the, the military would pay and we would have to finance the military. And believe me, we have ample military resources. My view right now is that it's ridiculous to even build up the military any further because they've given, in effect, the political leadership of this country has given repeated declarations tantamount to the statement, we're never going to use the weapons we have. It doesn't make any difference in what they do or how outrageous the provocation. Well, at a certain point, I'm going to start to agree with the liberals and say, well, what's the use of spending money on it then? We're never going to use it, so to hell with it. Now, I haven't reached that stage yet, but I start to sympathize with that view, that there is no point in having a military establishment if we won't use it no matter what is done to us. Here's a question that has a one-word answer. Was America morally right to supply Stalin with arms during World War II? No. It was certainly not right. Ayn Rand's solution to World War II was that we should have let Germany and Russia destroy each other and stood back on the side and said, go to it. <laughs> and then we would not have been in the situation that we are now. But the idea that we would ally ourselves with, quote, Uncle Joe, you're too young to know that that's what he was called during World War II, uh, this, this greatest mass murder of history, we should ally ourselves with Uncle Joe uh, to fight the Axis powers was as monstrous and evil an action as, as could be imagined. And of course, we're paying the price to this very day. All right, another one, yes. In your chapter on art, when you discuss music, would you be adding anything new to what Ayn Rand already said in Art of in my chapter on art, when I discuss music, will I be adding anything new to what Ayn Rand already said? <laughs> Emphatically not. I know no, I, I had so many negatives I couldn't get it out. <laughs> I do not know music. I mean, I know a few popular melodies and composers that I like, that's it. I am ignorant in that uh, field. And in fact, I could be, go more broadly than that. I'm generally ignorant about art with the exception of some novels and sculpture which I, with, that I like. I've never made a study of that. So in that chapter, above all else, above all others, I'm not going beyond what she herself actually said, including her own examples, because uh, I'm uh, very familiar with the fact that one of the uh, invitations to rationalism is when a person enters a field where he is not steeped in the concrete realities, it's very easy to start weaving and interspinning, you know, logical deductions detached from reality. So if you want a personal confession, I am more scared of the chapter on art than any other chapter in the book. I've even debated omitting it. Unfortunately, I can't omit it because I've also worked out a proof that aesthetics is necessary to a philosophy. I tried, you know, for a while. <laughs> No, I did try for a while to say aesthetics is just like philosophy of science or philosophy of law. You know, why, why do I have to include it? I'll just leave it. But I've worked out a proof as to why it's got to be part of pure philosophy. But in that particular chapter, I am going to have the least on principle original to say of any other chapter. Um, in general, let me say that I'm making every effort in this book not to go beyond what I am morally sure Ayn Rand herself would have agreed with. Whenever I get my, see myself writing on a point beyond something that I've either discussed with her or that I think is obvious in what I have already discussed with her, I simply mark it, new book, and put it in a separate box. And I've got a whole box full of stuff which I'm not which I've written, but which I'm definitely not using in this book because, in my mind, there's one chance in a thousand that if she read it, she might disagree. And this book has been called Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. So I'm erring on the side of excessive conservatism. And even then I'm going to have a preface in which I'm going to disclaim this as official doctrine. I'm going to say, you know, that I, objectivism officially is what Ayn Rand wrote. This is, I'll give my reasons for saying why I think this is an accurate statement and so on. But uh, uh, there are several places, more than several, there's hundreds of places where I have, in my opinion, improved 
on the original 1976 lecture course, which I started out editing in 84, and, uh, which I'm now going to be publishing. And uh, it could very well be the case. I hope that it is not the case that if Ayn Rand were to come back, some of those changes would have uh, enraged her. I'm doing my very best to avoid that, but I, I may not have uh, avoid, avoided it completely. So I'm, I'm telling you this uh, um, in advance. But of all possible subjects, the last one, if you rank them hierarchically, that I would dream of adding a note of my own on, note being a good word here, is music. OK, give me about 10 minutes, OK? Uh, I believe that Dr. Binswanger once said that the Arabs have no right to the oil under their feet. Do you agree? Yes. Uh, that oil had to be discovered by modern technology. And as I understand, in the countries involved, there was no private property system. They were nomadic uh, or dictatorial tribes. And consequently, property rights were not recognized. In a case like that, it's the same principle as, a, as the original colonists in regard to the Indians. Indigenous people have no right to that which they have not discovered and without having a private property system established. Uh, then the questioner goes on, well then, would an enterprising sheik have the right to go to the US and start drilling for oil in Death Valley or Yellowstone Park? And I would say, yes, if we had a proper private property system, not these vast tracts of government-owned parklands on the grounds that forest is an end in itself. Uh, but if it was all privately owned as it should be, and a sheik came to someone and said, I want the drilling rights, uh, and he purchased them, certainly. I uh, completely opposed to the uh, xenophobia that says the Japanese shouldn't be here, the, this one shouldn't be here, this one shouldn't be here, only Native Americans. I mean, who is a Native American? So uh, in that sense, it works both ways. Uh, OK. Yes. Now, one per person, because the color of your shirt looks familiar to me. But this, <laughs> All right, go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't, didn't hear it. To, to what extent does the, does the error of equating a definition with the concept being defined either directly or indirectly relate to the error of rationalism? To what extent does the error of equating a concept with its definition lead to rationalism? It certainly leads to rationalism because if you equate a concept with its definition, that means you detach the concept from the actual concretes in reality and all of their richness and with all of their attributes, and you just substitute a string of words for another word, which means you're already thinking only in floating words, which is rationalism. But that is not the primary error. That's really an expression of rationalism. A person who commits that type of error is already predisposed to rationalism, is already detached from reality. Now, as to, as to what predisposes a person to rationalism, that is a fascinating question asked more generally, on which I will have a lot to say in my next book. But um, uh, to give you just a hint, rationalism is a device that would appeal to intellectuals, good or bad, when they try to deal with a subject matter they do not know. That is to say, they want to organize their thinking. They want to, you know, something comes first, and something is a premise, and something is a conclusion. But they, their abstractions are not connected to concrete, either because the abstractions have been improperly formed, and or because they simply don't know the field. For instance, as, as in the case of me in regard to the history of art. And in a case like that, you are really ripe, if you enter the field, to be rationalistic. Because you have a smattering of a few concretes, and then you right away jump to the platonic realm of theory and start making deductions, and there's no check on you because there's no reality tie. This is, this is why, for instance, I would shy away. That's why I wasn't being sarcastic when I said I didn't specialize in love. I would shy away from pronouncements in regard to the philosophy of sex. Now, there's an awful lot you know, that you can say as a philosopher, but sex involves anatomy, physiology, 
psychology over and above philosophy. You have to, if you're going to make pronouncements about sex other than just, you know, what a philosopher says. I asked Ms. Rand once, what does a philosopher have to say about sex? And her answer was, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you go beyond that, you're already bringing in more than a philosopher, uh, you know, uh, specializes in. You have to know then sex. You have to study it in all its manifestations all the different forms and degrees, the different kinds of psychologies that could lead to the same behavior, etc. It's an entire field. And that's the danger, uh, the, what leads to rationalism and what puts philosophy in disrepute is people who think that because philosophic principles are universal, therefore you just have to toss around generalities and not immerse yourself in the concrete details of a given field. And uh, the answer is you can't do it. You've got to, in order to think accurately, you have to have two things. You have to have, of course, the right conceptual framework, but you also have to have intimate, detailed knowledge of uh, the concretes in a given field. And this is another reason, by the way, why I'm anticipating a question that I left for the end, but somebody asked me, is it true that Ayn Rand, near the end of her life, started to study physics from a tutor? No, not physics, but mathematics near the end of her life. She started taking formal lessons in mathematics. She was studying algebra, and I think they were going, on to, going to go on then to calculus and differential equations. And the reason was that she had in her mind the idea that there are many more connections between epistemology and higher mathematics than she had indicated in her theory of concept formation. And she had many pregnant and intriguing observations which she would toss off, but she would always say to me, that's just a hypothesis, that's just a guess. I don't know higher mathematics yet, but I'm studying it. And when I study it, I will then be able to do it. Unfortunately, she died before she did, but this was the reason why she felt she has to know higher mathematics in, in detail. It's also the reason why I, for instance, will never do any work on the philosophy of science even though I think induction is a fascinating question and an important question, I do not, I don't have the years left to immerse myself enough. Now, you know, I don't mean I'm illiterate about science, but you have to know all the key steps. The way I know the history of philosophy, you have to know the history of science and its current state before you can then start philosophizing on what are the problems of scientific theory construction and so on. It is not enough to watch three puppy dogs wag their tails when they're happy and say, now let's solve the problem of induction. You know, all puppy dogs wag their tails when, when they're happy, which, is, which would lead you to rationalism. I went into a long speech there. I think just as a general, my purpose is to try to knock rationalism out of people, but uh, myself first and foremost. Um, I'm going to take one more written question, then I'm going to switch over to part two. Now, of all these, uh, this is abortion. Uh, this one I can get. Give me one second to condense here. Uh, why get married? I'll, you'll have to decide that. <laughs> um, I answered this one once in another question period in another city, so I'll have to. <laughs> I'll give myself two last written general and then I'll move over to the next topic. This one is uh, in discussions of the, it's a long one, but I'm only reading one paragraph of it. In discussions on the issue of abortion, why don't rights begin at conception? Or rather, explain when they do begin and why. Rights begin at birth when the umbilical cord is severed. The reason for that is that that is the first time we have an entity. In other words, a separate phenomenon rather than simply a component. That is something which is part of another uh, uh, phenomenon. And to be an entity is inherent in the definition of man, a, uh, of a human being. An entity is then subdivided into various types uh, including organism, which is subdivided into animal, which is then subdivided into various types, including the rational animal. But the precondition is that it be an entity. 
Um, now, that does not mean, to anticipate a question, that I therefore regard every act of abortion prior to the severing of the umbilical cord as moral. That does not follow. If a person has knowledge uh, of the growing fetus or embryo and has an opportunity to, to decide the question, it was voluntary and so on, and chooses to evade the whole issue, or says, I don't know, I'll worry about it later. Uh, I don't uh, uh, want to make up my mind, or I'll have it, or tomorrow I know I don't want it, yes, I'll have it, or just, uh, you know, lives in a, in a general stupor, and then in the eighth or seventh or whichever month decides, uh, I'm going to uh, butcher this thing, I don't regard that as moral, not on the grounds of violating rights, but on the grounds of irrationality. Now, there may be cases where, for medical reasons, a person has to defer an abortion that late. But properly speaking, the clear-cut case is the first trimester, when you know, and the thing hasn't the remotest resemblance to being uh, uh, human. After that, I think the onus is on the aborter to explain why they did not have it during the first trimester. And there can be reasons, but it doesn't mean, you know, it's deuces wild up to there. But the fact that something is immoral, however, does not mean it violates rights. It is immoral to go up to a puppy dog, even your own, let alone anybody else's, and stick a knife through its throat because you're in a bad mood. But that does not violate the dog's rights. That is a wanton anti-life act. And you can properly be regarded as a killer that other people don't want to deal with. But you can't be put in jail as a right violator. And there's the, the analogy here, I think, is, uh, is very clear. Now, the last one uh, of these written, what modifications would you make to your lectures on moral principles um, uh, as you delivered the material in 1987, now that you've rewritten the chapter on the virtues? Well, uh, I'd have to go through every virtue, basically, the way I went through independence, but I'll tantalize you with just one change of subhead. And in fact, I can't even remember the new one, but I remember the essence of the difference. Since integrity was one of the ones I covered last time, I'll give you the old subhead and the new one. And you can, will know in two years exactly what I mean. <laughs> the old subhead was integrity as the, I forget, the integration or the unity of mind and body. It was something like that. The new one is something, I can't remember the wording anymore, but it was something like, Fidelity in action to principle. Now, that will give you a clue. Uh, it's just a clue, but it's a clue. If you combine it with our discussion of independence. No, now I've got to switch to the second one here. This whole fact and value situation. I had a lot of questions on that. And I'm giving a certain amount of time to that starting now. Now, you know, there are certain people that you can go on forever on this topic, and I don't intend to do that. But I'm going to say the things that I regard as warranted within the time available. And I, first, I want to make a preliminary prepared statement, because I had some reason to expect that there would be some questions. So I thought maybe I'd just make a few uh, opening remarks on this general topic. Uh, there is substantial agitation uh, throughout uh, certain quarters of the, let's call it, objectivist movement over the fact value article and the uh, fact that I requested David Kelly's expulsion from the Ayn Rand Institute and over this whole trauma. And I would, uh, some people are really in agony over it. And without seeming or wanting to seem sadistic, I want to begin by saying that I'm very glad of that. That is why I wrote the article. Uh, uh, I believe that from the beginning, uh, I'm not looking at any one person here, so the principle is if the shoe fits, wear it, and if it doesn't, please forgive me. I believe that from the very beginning of objectivism as a movement, going back way into the 50s, there has been a certain subjectivist element 
that has attached itself uh, under the banner of individualism and selfishness uh, to our philosophy. And uh, we have waged a continuous battle uh, against these people. And uh, uh, this is a, a battle that is simply being reenacted in your generation over again. There are too many subjectivists posing as objectivists. And uh, not to put too fine a point on it, we need a purge. Uh, I don't use the methods of purging uh, of a, uh, you know, a dictator in the sense I have no armed troops and no physical forces. Uh, nor do I uh, regard objectivism as a religion. But I sympathize with the idea, leaving aside content and methods, that if you hold an ideology, and it is a tall and integrated consistent ideology, you have no patience for people who repudiate it. Now this requires that the people involved are able to understand the difference between details, applications, concretes. Within any philosophy, vast disagreements are possible on, on this type of level. Harry Binswanger and I disagree on a hundred points and will fight for hours, but neither of us has the slightest suspicion that the other one is in disagreement with the principles of objectivism although we get really enraged uh, over our disagreements. But there are certain essentials that are outside the pale. That is to say, it's a free country. You can believe whatever you believe. But if you deny those essentials, you're outside the movement. Now, I'll give it to you a, a, a case where I am in complete sympathy with the Catholic Church on this point. Namely, you know the priests and nuns that want to be free thinkers and the demand the right to teach in Catholic schools, departing from a central Catholic, Catholic do doctrine on the grounds that this is their independent judgment. And then the Vatican excommunicates them or says, you know, you can't do it, and all the liberals say, what an outrage. Now, I do not regard this as an outrage. This is a voluntary organization. The church and the Vatican never for one moment hid their viewpoint. They never said, we are a non-denominational, non-sectarian. We welcome all views. They said, we have a text. Our entire view is based on this. We have 2,000 years elaborating what is and isn't consistent with it. You want to teach in our schools under our auspices, receive our patronage, etc. you agree. You don't agree, goodbye. And even they have a definition of what is essential and what isn't, and allow certain room. Now, I entirely sympathize with the church in that regard. If these dissidents in the church want to teach, they should, have the, they should have the grace to say, we are lapsed Catholics, or we do not agree with, with Catholicism. Our viewpoint is neo-Catholicism, or, or whatever they want to call it. But it is, it is fraud on their part. And the same thing applies to any ideology, and it certainly applies to objectivism, which has more than just a generally coherent ideology, but a completely systematic, integrated viewpoint. And therefore, uh, when I hear an outright assault on the fundamentals of objectivism all the way down to the very concept which gave it its name, namely objectivity, that is the end of my patience. I can tolerate a tremendous amount of disagreements up to a point, but I have a clear hierarchy in mind of where I draw the line. And the article in question that I blasted in my piece, Fact and Value, is beyond that line. Now, I'm not open to questions on whether I misrepresented that article or not. I'm simply not open to discussion on that point because I know a principle when I see one. And the word primarily thrown in now and then as garnished has no effect on me, whatever. <laughs> now, I, 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 I quickly admit that I don't always see when I don't have a principle. My lecture on independence is an example of that. But I certainly can see a principle when someone beats me over the head with it. And the principle that I saw and explained at length in fact and value is why that article that I was blasting rejects objectivism at the root. 
Now, uh, I, I want to make my attitude on this entirely clear. When I make a decision on a matter of ideology, that is it for me. I do not read anything further, ever, by or in support of that viewpoint. Life is too short. My desk is already piled high with crucial positive things that I cannot get to reading. Therefore, I will never again read any correspondence explaining that article to me, any further answers coming from that side, any 400-page tracts as to why it was I misinterpreted it, etc., and so on. I simply don't accept that mode of operation. I see a principle. I know it's there. I don't care whether the person involved agrees or disagrees with my analysis, and I don't care how many thousands of other people agree or disagree. I have the same attitude in this regard, not to equate the moral crimes to Kant and Hitler, uh, although I certainly am not saying that, that David uh, is in the same category morally. But I am saying I would not, after reading the Critique of Pure Reason or reading Mein Kampf, entertain further discussion from the authors or sympathizers as to why I really misinterpreted it. Nor would I even read a rewritten version that softens certain passages and takes out the worst atrocities. It's closed, it's dead, and that's, that's the end of it as far as I'm concerned. Now you would say, well, but what if the person, putting it theoretically, really ch changes his mind completely? That was covered in my lecture on under the topic of forgiveness, which I wrote two years ago. Protestations of atonement have no content or cognitive value, whatever. There is nothing easier than to commit a crime and say, oh, I see I was wrong, I'll never do it again. Forgiveness requires being earned, and that requires a long process of thought and action demonstrated across years commensurate with the stature of the crime. Now, in this case, in my judgment, the uh, evil represented by the paper I was blasting is so enormous that I am too old for the necessary time to pass. Supposing that the individual involved reformed tomorrow, I would be dead of old age before I would be convinced that he had reformed. Therefore, for me, that is a lifetime closed issue. Now, some of you in your teens, you know, you'll have to worry about that after I'm gone. Now that raises the question, don't I believe that even if the paper that I attacked, I call it that because I don't think it had a title, uh, was wrong, couldn't it be an honest error? Now I don't really think it's right to comment on a given individual's honesty in his absence. But I'll just have to confine myself to generalities, therefore. Someone gave me this argument, actually gave me this argument, which I give him, you know, commend him for having the courage to confront me with this in person. He said, well, you just confessed error on Thursday in your lecture, so maybe, Kelly, maybe everybody's error is honest. If you could commit an error of that stature, who are you to say that anybody is being dishonest in what they think? Now, I regard this as fantastic as an argument, but since it was given to me, I may as well tell you what's wrong with it. There are errors and errors. The error that I made, since I have to bring myself in since the person raised me, was a failure properly to validate a principle of objectivism. And that did imply a contradiction of certain objectivist points. It implied a mind-body dichotomy by, by separation of intellectual and existential improperly. But if there's a difference between doing something badly and implying an error as against an all-out, integrated, unified assault on the essence of objectivism. Now, I have made, it would be countless errors, thanks to rationalism, which I grew up as and which I had pounded into me at university, thanks to psychological problems, thanks to the fact that I am not a genius, I have made more than my share of errors in my lifetime. I would defy anybody to equal the number of philosophic errors that I have made with, with, with very little provocation because I had Ayn Rand as my teacher. She was, she was time and again furious at me. How could I say such a thing? 
But the difference is this, never once in my wildest errors did I ever come out against a blatant objectivist principle. They were all forms of being taken in by something at school and not knowing how to answer it, or not knowing properly how to validate something, or not knowing properly how to integrate something. But I nowhere ever came out and said, in effect, down with morality, down with justice, down with judgment, let's love everybody. I mean, as my stupidest, I knew better than that. <laughs> now, to put it in terms of a general principle, to determine a person's intellectual honesty, you need to know two things. What knowledge is available to him, and what is the nature of the error? And then you put those two together. And a child is not blamed as an adult. An adult is not blamed like an ordinary professor. An ordinary professor is innocent compared to a professional philosopher relative to a certain category of error because of what you expect them to know given their, uh, their specialization. We are talking here about a trained philosopher. And I, I'm in an uncomfortable position of making an outright attack on someone who isn't here to defend himself, but I don't know how else to do this. I'll put it in general terms. If a trained philosopher who knows Ayn Rand's works intimately, all of them, and who knows the history of philosophy intimately, all of it, I say any such individual Certain categories of error are impossible, honestly. Certain kinds of error are simply too gross a departure from what he knows is true with too blatant a motivation underlying it. So leaving aside any long other history of the individual involved, with which I am not going to regale you because this event does not come out of context, but just speaking of uh, this one thing alone, this grosser departure from a, the essence of objectivism, in this context, I do not believe is honest and will never believe that it is. Now, the only exception to this would be if someone were to tell me, well, what about a trained philosopher uh, uh, you know, who knew all this, but he was dumb. He just didn't have the IQ involved to put it all together. Or he was, he was so uh, um, psychoepistemologically deranged that he simply didn't have the capacity to think, period. I would say, yes, that would exculpate the person. I don't believe that's applicable in this case. I certainly uh, give David Kelly the credit of being an intelligent and a reasonable person in terms of his capacity to think. And therefore, I have no conclusion but the one that I said. I simply don't believe it can be done honestly in that context. Now, I want to make one further distinction here, which I learned from Ayn Rand. The distinction between the guilt borne by the originator of an error and the people he takes in by it. For instance, I would often go to Ayn Rand with a question. I'd ask her something, and she would get furious. She'd say, why are you saying you know, this and it means so and so and so and so? And uh, you know, at a certain point, I would get it and I would say, well, then I would explain to her that we had a lecture in school and the professor said so and so, and uh, that's what I can't answer. And her attitude would change right away because she would say, oh, I see that. You didn't originate it, you just fell for it. <laughs> and I said, yes. She said, well, that makes all the difference in the world because the uh, person who falls for it is relatively speaking innocent. He just like walks into the mind that somebody else placed. And so you can't, you know, it depends on his acumen and his knowledge and so on. Can he see his way out of it or not? But if somebody originates a whole assault, that is entirely different. They are then the primary culprit. Uh, and that is where the issue of dishonesty comes up. Now, I know many, many cases, well, many, many is too many, but one many cases of people that I respected that read the Kelly paper originally and told me they couldn't see anything wrong with it. And in fact, they liked certain parts of it. Now, the first one or two people, I was truly astounded because they were people who were in objectivism for some time. I couldn't believe that. 
Uh, I contrasted that with my wife's reaction, who was not a trained philosopher. She read the, Ke the Kelly paper several days before I did. I was putting it off because I hate to you know, get en enmeshed in these things. She was livid for 48 hours. She couldn't, she was just, my wife said, in a perpetual fury over this, and she would closet herself for hours with this and come back with whole notebooks filled with denunciations. So finally I figured, I've got to read this, you know, what could be provoking her to this extent. Uh, um, but as I say, there were some people who weren't in that position. And after enough cases, I realized there are obviously some issues here that honest people can, must have been taken in by. So I decided and agreed to do the article. In most cases, in most cases, uh, the people in question phoned me the day the article came out and said, and the issue is now self-evident. I see where I was taken in. You were absolutely right. And then, the, as far as I'm concerned, then the slate is clean. If they haven't, then I don't care to deal with them further. That is my attitude. Now, all this is by way of saying that the only questions that I want to discuss in regard to the fact and value issue are purely philosophical questions. That is, I will not answer any questions about Kelly's article, about his proper interpretation, or about his moral character, only about the substance of the issues involved. And here are some written questions that make some, that have some good points, so I will try to answer them briefly, although I do not want to monopolize the whole question period on this. So <clears throat> I'll try to be brief. Now, uh, Diane, you stop me at a quarter to three no matter what, okay? okay? Can you give an example of how differences in degree of evil are evaluated? For example, how would you compare the moral status of the average 1980s American academic Marxist to the moral status of Stalin's? That's obvious. I assume you've read my article, because if you haven't, you have no, any idea of the context of any of these questions, but I'm certainly not going to reiterate it. It's in the Intellectual Activist of um, May 18, 1989. Yes, I would say the average 1980s American academic Marxist is worse in one regard and better in another than Stalin. He's better in the obvious sense that he did not himself go out and commit murder, but he is worse in the sense that he is the one that made it possible. He and his intellectual ammunition maker. Without him, there would have been no Stalin and no mass murder. So it's who is worse, uh, the, the man who uh, trains thugs or the thug once he's let loose? And, uh, it, and fundamentally, you have to say that tr the thug tr trainer, he creates the thugs. He creates the killers. He creates a nation which is prostrate and at the mercy of those killers. Well, then, who is to blame? And in that very serious regard, an average 1980s American academic Marxist is worse than Stalin. I will stand by that till the day I die. Now, uh, I understand another question. I understand the dangers of sanctioning evil and sanctioning the sanctioners. What I am having trouble with is determining where to draw the line. Here are three concrete examples. Is it okay to speak to the local Republican Party? And if so, why? Yes. Republicans and Democrats, by definition, are coalitions. They have no principles. That's what's wrong with them. But that's also why it's okay to do anything with them. <laughs> they don't even have the principle of repudiating principles, like the libertarians. They literally stand for nothing. They're just a coalition of factors socioeconomic and racial and geographic and intellectual and you name it, they take it. So uh, you commit yourself to nothing when you address the Republican Party. Second, is it okay to debate socialists? Why not? John Ridpath does it all the time. The principle is a socialist is honest in this context. That is to say, he is not presenting himself as a variant of objectivism. He is not, it would be wrong to say, to enter a debate, is Reardon Medal a lethal product of greed? It would be wrong to enter a debate, is socialism a legitimate application of objectivism? 
anybody that entered that debate, I would say, is debating the undebatable. But if someone comes out and says, I'm for government planning of the economy, and I'm going to openly say, this is not your view, this is, your view is anathema, and you want to debate it, particularly before an audience as an educational device, by the fact of debating it, you are doing the opposite of sanctioning it. You are, however, I, I have to correct myself, you are granting that it at least is legitimate to discuss this in public. You're, you're, you're regarding that much. Now, there are things I would not debate in public. I would debate with a socialist. I would not debate with a communist. I would not debate with a libertarian. I have debated with religionists on the air. But as soon as they bring in faith, I say, I'm sorry, that's outside the discussion. Faith is not subject to rational discussion by your claim, therefore we can't talk about that. And that, you know, has an effect on the discussion too. <laughs> Now another example, this is the last one from this questioner. Is it all right to speak to the AMA, the American Medical Association? Yes, it's okay. I don't know why you would do it. But uh, it's morally uh, all right because this is an organization tied by a profession which commits you to nothing and which has one goal, which is to try to stave off socialized medicine. Unfortunately, their idea of staving it off is to anticipate it. But, uh, so they're very poor in that way, and they wouldn't listen to a principled presentation, certainly not the leadership, but they don't proclaim that they're for weakness. Now, if they walked around saying, our motto is weakness above all else, let us capitulate, and call themselves the American Capitulationist Society, then I would say it's immoral to address them. But uh, it's not like that. Now, I don't know how many more examples to give before the point is clear, but that's the three that were asked. Now on tolerance. Does tolerance necessarily involve skepticism? Yes, I explained why in my article. What then is the proper term to use in denoting an understanding and considerate approach to those with opposing views? Now listen to this. An understanding and considerate approach to those with opposing views. There is no term to denote that, because there is no such concept in a proper person's mind. So you couldn't condense it into a concept. To understand and, and consider, be considerate toward an opposing view, assuming we're talking here on a level of significance, that is, we're talking about freedom versus dictatorship, or uh, egoism versus self-sacrifice, or reason versus uh, uh, a religion or something, you know, was significant. The fact that you hold a philosophy and that you take it seriously prohibits and precludes you from having a, quote, considerate approach to that view. That's precisely what you will refuse to consider. That's what you will refuse to, quote, understand. Now, of course, you can understand in the sense of psychologically explain, psychoepistemologically explain. You can consider in the sense of show, as anybody does with a wrong view, how many other errors are involved and what, what it connects to and what a disaster it leads to and so on. But there is no such thing as an understanding and considerate approach to those with opposing views. And the formulation of this question is exactly what the concept tolerance is intended to designate. It means don't take ideas seriously. Go toward anybody understand and be considered no matter what he says, including outright call for mass murder. Now that is what you cannot do if you take ideas seriously. And if you don't, then I don't think we should have an approach toward anybody's views at all. If you don't take them seriously, don't be considered or inconsiderate. Just keep your mouth shut and go about your business. That's my answer. Now next, why do you call someone, this is excerpted from a very long question, but there's only so much time. Why do you call someone who may not yet understand the issues involved an anti-objectivist rather than someone who may just be learning? I don't call anyone who does not understand the issues involved an anti-objectivist. I happen to have, just by luck, a copy of that passage. 
And I would like to quote you so you can see that this is not my viewpoint. I wish to make a request to any unadmitted anti-objectivist reading this piece. And I proceed to define exactly what I mean in the next sentence by anti-objectivist. If you reject the concept of objectivity and the necessity of moral judgment, if you sunder fact and value, mind and body, concepts and percepts, if you agree with the Brandon or Kelly viewpoint or anything resembling it, etc., please drop out of our movement. I did not say if you do not understand the issues. Failure to understand leaves wide open. There's a hundred reasons for failure to understand, some innocent, some uh, not innocent. What I object to is people who agree with the views I just indicated and call themselves objectivists. Now that is fraud. That is not a failure to understand. And uh, let, to cover another point here, I've been asked, does a person have to agree with every detail in every one of your sentences in fact and value? First of all, you don't have to agree at all. It's a free country. You could say Peikoff is crazy, to hell with him, and to hell with objectivism. I wish you would say it. The thing that I object, and certainly anybody can legitimately disagree with any wording, because the wording, you can show the same sentence to 12 people, and they can come up with 12 different interpretations. I'm talking about essentials, and if you do not know what essentials are now, I can't elaborate it any further. It is not every wording, every example, every comma, it is the necessity of moral judgment, the necessity of objectivity, the integration of concepts and percepts, fact and values, cognition and evaluation. That is what my piece was about. And if you disagree on that level, then I think that you are wrong in calling yourself an objectivist. And I'm, I have no doubt that Ms. Rand would have put it in much stronger terms. It's an issue of deciding in essentials. And if you agree in essentials with David Kelly or Nathaniel Brandon, or, you know, it doesn't make any difference whether you call the thing you're for tolerance or compassion or kindness or brother love or astral vision. I don't care what, what uh, name you give it. You should have the honesty to say, whatever I am, I'm not an objectivist. And in fact, I wouldn't even mind if, you, if someone were to come to one of these conferences and say, I don't purport to be an objectivist. As a matter of fact, I don't even agree with objectivism. I like certain ideas of Ayn Rand and not others. And I'm here without any false pretenses. I wouldn't have a problem with that. I don't know whether I speak for Professor Reisman, but I would have no problem with that. My problem is people who are trying to subvert objectivism as such by stating that these corrupt views are part of it or are compatible with it. As long as you are prepared to say, I'm not an objectivist, I don't agree with it on these points, fine. Then I think it's honest and, you know, uh, the ones I do not want taking my courses or paying contributions to the institute or coming to conferences are those who misrepresent themselves in the way that I've just indicated. Now this next one says, thank you. Now I've actually covered this because Thank you. George Reisman says he agrees. Um, um, I've already covered this. It says, are you saying that if I do not agree totally that you would prefer that I stop contributing to ARI, attending TJS, and calling myself an objectivist? If by totally you mean every detail, I've covered that. No. But if by totally you mean in total essentials, yes. I would much rather objectivism vanish from the face of the earth and have nobody left but a handful of people that, that remain true to the essence of this philosophy than have a flourishing mass movement which is unrecognizable because it has no relationship to what Ayn Rand wrote. <laughs> now, our time is running out here. I know Diane is going to tell me that I have. I'm out of time, right? One more minute. One more minute. Um, all right, I got two last ones I'm going to do on this, and that's it. Please don't raise them from the floor on this topic. 
What is the moral difference between your promotional signing of the ominous parallels at laissez-faire books and David Kelly's speech at a libertarian dinner? There's only one small difference. I understand that that's been widely circulated. It is certainly true that I went to laissez-faire books and signed copies of the ominous parallels. What is the one small fact that is being omitted by the people who circulate this as an example of my alleged hypocrisy and self-contradiction? This was in 1982. The people involved had just that month, as I recall, taken over the bookstore. They had no discernible ideological views, whatever. We tried to investigate, and all we were told was, we have no connection to the old owners, we're starting from scratch, we have no ideological affiliations of any kind. Certainly, the idea of libertarianism was never even dreamed of in that context. Uh, there's a little bit more available knowledge now, which has been itemized, some of it in Peter Schwartz's article, than I had available to me in 1982. And now, this is a good question, and really, I've given a seminar on this at home, and it's a really interesting question, but it takes a whole a decent answer. It would take a good 20 minutes, but I, I couldn't evade this. Some objectivists have trouble understanding Ayn Rand's statement that every is implies an ought. Now, this, I regard this as a perfectly good philosophic question, which was raised to be already, as I say. They claim it is invalid, her principle. Notice, she, hers is unrestricted. Every is implies an ought. And when she says every, she means every. So she, the question goes on, they claim this is invalid, taking it to mean that every minute fact, such as the number of blades of grass in a field, must be relevant to one's life. Could you explain the error in this? There is no error in this. Every is implies an odd and every minute fact, including the number of blades of grass in a field, is relevant in a context. Now, I'll give you the example. We had a whole class, I give some private seminars in California to some students. We had a, somebody raised uh, the question, well, apples are red. Well, what evaluations are implicit in that? That's cognition. And we listed a whole host of them, but the obvious one is if apples are red, then you know right away that if you see one with a big brown patch in the side of it, what? Something is wrong with this apple. <laughs> and you ought not to eat it. Now we have many more. Someone said, what about the sky is blue? And that's true. And right away, I'm giving you just the self-evident. I mean, you could write a whole encyclopedia of what that implies. But for instance, if you look outside during the day and it's black, <laughs> you've got a big implication there. <laughs> now, as to the number of blades of grass in a field, normally we don't bother counting it. So if you're counting them, and you're doing it rationally, there must be a purpose. And the purpose will tell you the relevance of the information. For instance, why would a person count them? Maybe he's trying a new brand of fertilizer. And he wants to see how many blades of grass there are in this plot as against that one. Well, then obviously there are going to be implications. If this one is twice as thick as that, it's good, unless he wants a special kind of miniature golf with very thin blades, in which case it's bad, etc. Or maybe he has suspicions that his neighbor, you know, is trampling on his grass and pulling them out. <laughs> so he's going to count the number of blades and grass and see. And if he sees, well, this has the same number as all the other parts which my neighbor can't get to, that exonerates him. In other words, knowledge has to have a point. But if knowledge has a point, any knowledge, however minute, has implications for action. Every is implies an ought. That concludes the fact value discussion. Now, I have some questions that 
I don't know, on the spur of the moment, I put down that these were more personal, but in looking at them, they don't seem too personal to me, but uh, let me take a few. Uh, given your statement that you will not be speaking in the Ford Hall Forum next spring, will there be a talk by another objectivist? Uh, no, uh, we're de right now we're considering um, uh, trying to make it around Thanksgiving uh, on the premise that I finish uh, the book in time, but I'm truly going to do nothing until I finish the book. So it's pretty much up in the air at this point. Now why I put this, oh I see. What is the difference between the concepts matter and existence? How you like me classifying that under personal. Um, <laughs> Um, the answer to that is this. Read the expanded edition of Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, which will be out in February or March. Uh, one of the professors at the, uh, uh, one of those workshops said to her, what is the difference between the proposition existence exists and the proposition there is a physical world? And she gave a long, impassioned answer of what, why existence was an axiom and matter was a very advanced, highly sophisticated scientific concept which would require centuries of development to reach. And what were the stages involved in reaching it? So I wouldn't even dream of trying to recapitulate that here, but, there, but I would refer you to this expanded edition where it's covered in detail. Are there any further writings of Ms. Rand's on the aesthetics of painting, sculpture, and architecture that will be published at a later date? I don't know of any on painting or sculpture. I will be bringing out her journals, which are filled with all of her notes on architecture and her thoughts as she was writing The Fountainhead. I've only skimmed them. I don't know how much of it is aesthetic theory. Uh, regarding architecture and how much is more specific for the characterization and the plot and so on. But knowing her, uh, there would be a lot of architectural aesthetics in there. Um, that's the only thing that I know of. Now I better go back to some uh, uh, oral questions here on anything but the fact value issue. And only new people. I know I've, I must have asked. Yes. Uh, do you have any news about the Atlas Shrug Movie Project. I think that's in here. It's formulated, will you answer the standard question, please? <laughs> Do I have any news about the Atlas Shrug Movie uh, Project? No. Uh, how can I give you an, uh, the best, uh, I really don't know. The best I can say is that it seems to be, I say seems because I haven't really been following it too closely, there haven't been a lot of developments recently, it seems to be the emerging consensus that a theatrical movie is going to have insuperable obstacles. Uh, a three-hour movie has been attempted as script and it seems that the abbreviation necessary, as far as we can tell, is such that there wouldn't be much left of Atlas in the movie. Uh, a four hour has been attempted. I haven't yet had a chance to see it, the script, but uh, I've been told that once it reaches over four hours or even in that vicinity, it becomes commercially prohibitive uh, because you can only have so many releases, uh, showings in a given day in a the theater. So it looks like we're caught in terms of a theatrical movie that it's just too long to do justice to the book and be commercially viable. So that comes back to a mini-series, which is back again on the front burner. But uh, the problem there is, of course, the networks are all adamant, for the same reasons as always, with regard to um, uh, the mini-series. So the only hope is the... Uh, the, the, the second string, I don't mean that pejoratively, but like the cable people or the uh, uh, smaller networks, etc. 
And the problem there is really financial. They're not rich enough to put up the kind of money that is required, not for quality, but for the length of the project. Because here again, it would have to be probably six to eight hours counting commercials to be tantamount to a four-hour movie. And uh, you know, with repetitions from repri reprises from the day before, and so on and so on. And you're talking about real money. Uh, so whether that's going to develop or not, I do not know. There is some interest, but uh, there's tremendous obstacles. And uh, I wouldn't want to raise your hopes. I couldn't even, if I had to make a bet, I couldn't bet what's going to happen. I wouldn't even have an informed guess as to whether a miniseries will actually finally reach the day, or a theatrical movie will somehow be made commercially viable, or the thing will be put on the shelf until the copyright runs out, and then it's in the public domain. And then it's out of my control, but I'll be dead by then. I don't know. Uh, another one from the floor. I'm trying to go around the room, but I can only see hands in the front. Yes. How is force involved in fraud? Didn't you ask me that at a cocktail party? Oh. How is force involved in fraud? Fraud is an indirect form of force. Force means, in the broadest term, the initiation of coercion against the consent and agreement of the person involved. Now, if I say to you, give me $10, and I will give you a lecture on objectivism, and you give me the $10, and I give you a lecture on carrots and peas, you can say, give me my $10 back. And I say, why? I gave a lecture. You say, yeah, but I, what you gave is not what I agreed to get. So it's tantamount to stealing my $10. It's exactly the same moral as if you put, I put my hand in your pocket and pulled out $10. It's an indirect form of force. It is putting you in a position where the transaction is involuntary by misrepresenting the nature of it to you. Anything else? That's, I mean, it doesn't have to be personal. That can be a philosophic question, too. Um, yes. Didn't you already ask one? Yes. No, you. Uh, that a man who's under force literally cannot think at all. And I understand well, the example of the No, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. Because I know what you're going to ask. I, you couldn't make the statement, a man who is under force literally cannot think at all. That is not the case. I made it in a specific context. I said, insofar as the conclusion to which he is, comes is decreed by a gun, and reality is out of bounds, so that if he attempts to pursue the path of reality, he'll be shot or, or harmed, then he cannot think on that question. Now, this leaves open, uh, first of all, subterranean thought. If he's not you know, put in a cell and brainwashed you know, and, and tortured and starved to the point where thought is impossible, if he's left alone, he can think in his own mind. He might even take the risk of writing it out on paper. So to that extent, he can think, because then he can reestablish the connection to reality. But then it has to be when he's outside the jurisdiction of, his, of the forces to that extent. And of course, he doesn't dare then act on his conclusions. Now, do you still have a question, or did that clarify? OK. That's why I worded that passage very, very carefully. All right, right? Yes. You. Uh, could you explain more fully what is a stolen concept? Hmm. A stolen concept, what is that? A stolen concept is a concept to which you have no logical right. That's why it's called stolen, because you are denying or ignoring one of the earlier concepts on which it depends. And there's uh, all kinds of examples uh, of that fallacy. For instance, to say logic is arbitrary. Arbitrary is a stolen concept, because you can't reach the concept arbitrary until you first have the concept logical. Then you say the arbitrary is that which is reached without a process of logic. But if you try to say logic is arbitrary, 
then if it comes under arbitrary, what does arbitrary mean? How did you get that? What is it in contrast to? You're stealing that concept, you see. For, for details, again, uh, this, is, this one is covered in chapter 5. No, excuse me, chapter 4. Yeah. Okay, Phil, you may as well. Go ahead. Yeah. not just the power of subpoena, but wider issues, uh, the propriety of subpoenas. Well, let me interrupt you. You want me to go into the philosophy of law, and I will not do it, because I do not know the field of law, and I've prepared the way for this answer by what I said about sex and art. I'm more ignorant of law than I am of sex and art. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, this doesn't mean, you know, I couldn't say something that would make you happy. Uh, but uh, it wouldn't be very deep, it wouldn't be very integrated, and it would spring 12 leaks that you would need to know later anyway. So uh, I would rather, in our uh, concluding, we have what, a few minutes more, is that right? Uh, I would rather not go into, philosophy is big enough uh, to, to, you know, since it covers the totality without getting into Law too. You haven't asked one yet? Okay. What, you detailed what chapters um, 1 through 8 of your book are going to be about. What about chapters 9 through 13? What are the titles of chapters 9 through 13? Yeah, 9 is happiness. That is the uh, reward of virtue, you see. And that includes sex as one subdivision. Um, 10 is government. That's the basic principles of rights and the function of government. Eleven is capitalism. And that is uh, a philosophic analysis of capitalism, primarily from the point of view of its moral and epistemological roots. Um, uh, Twelve, which I'm just starting, is art. That's aesthetics. And thirteen is history. And that's basically the objective is view of the role of uh, ideas in history, the role of philosophy, culminating with some kind of, you know, overview of where we are and where we might be going. Now, uh, 13, the last one, will be a breeze because it's basically a condensation of the ominous parallels, you know, but with an American rather than a German slant. So I'm that f I know inside out, but 12 is the reason that I'm giving myself till next June. I could have the book in in December if it wasn't for art, but I'm afraid of every sentence that I write on art, so I have to write it, put it aside, and come back in two months and try and tear it apart and end up with Ayn Rand's words anyway. So uh, that's why I'm giving myself all the time. A written question. <clears throat> um, when I contemplate the kind of dessert Ayn Rand received from N. Brandon, my soul aches. Mine too, I may add. I consider Ms. Rand to have been the greatest person in history and most able to live a happy, efficacious life. Even so, it took her some time to spot Brandon's Trojan horse type of soul. How do you guard yourself against similar types of second-handed power lusters and flock gatherers with their cloaks of priesthood inner circles and pecking orders? Can you point out some tips or principles for fraud busting? <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, the, the, the error of intellectuals is that they judge by people's statements. They judge by people's ideas. And of course, people's ideas are not irrelevant. Uh, particularly if they're bad ideas, that makes it simple. But if they preach the right ideas, it's still wide open. Because you don't know whether they know what those ideas mean, or have integrated them into their uh, psychology and character, or act according to them. And uh, therefore, I would put it this way, the statement that somebody hold such and such rational ideas is a necessary but absolutely not sufficient condition of anything in terms of any positive uh, human appraisal. 
I could astound you if I read to you some of the mail that I get on a regular basis, which begins, I think Adler Shrugged is the greatest novel I ever read. I agree with everything Ayn Rand holds. It's brilliant. It expressed what I always believed. So on and so on. Effusive. And then it'll have some zinger like, I, I don't see why she's against um, tyranny. Or, I mean, that, you know, because uh, um, most people are too stupid to see her truth, so shouldn't she be a dictator and force it on the educational system, you see? They, they have the most fantastic, grotesque things, uh, as so that I have reached the stage that if somebody tells me they agree 100% with Atlas Shrugged, it has exactly the emotional meaning to me as if somebody says it's raining outside. Yes, well, I'll look and see if it's raining, okay, but. I mean, it just doesn't mean a thing, nothing. Now, you may, you may call that a hardened attitude, but I have certainly, I mean, there was a time, you know, I would be very enthusiastic when I heard that somebody agreed with objectivism. Now, if anything, it's an obstacle, because it, it simply raises tremendous suspicions in my mind. You know, I feel more at home with non-objectivists, to be perfectly frank, much of the time, you know, because they don't purport to agree with me. And therefore, there's no, I don't have to get excited and upset. If they disagree on 10 things, that's fine. My relationship is demarcated to subsume only the areas where you know, we work together or whatever, and that's it. The only ultimate answer is you, you can't, Ayn Rand took a long time to get to approve someone. So that refutes what I was about to say, is don't do it too hastily. She was very slow. Uh, she knew me. And I'm not, you know, an evil person. She knew me, I would say, um, at least 11 years on a regular basis before she decided that I was an essentially decent person. She put it in better terms than decent, but I'm not going to repeat that. But, uh, and there were reasons why, but she just felt, you know, I was young, I was floundering, I was in chaos intellectually, I was going to graduate school. No matter how often it looked like I understood something, the next day I came out with some incredible statement. And she never knew what to make of me entirely. Uh, and it was up to 11 years into our relationship that she said, now I'm convinced that you are OK. <laughs> um, so even that's not an answer. I don't know the answer. I wish I knew the answer to this question. Now a couple of last written ones, and then I think we'll call it to a halt. Is it contrary to objectivist principles to read Nathaniel Brandon's book, Judgment Day? And have you read the book? No, I haven't read the book, and I don't intend to, for the reason that I mentioned in connection with the Kelly issue. Life is too short uh, for that. It's not contrary to objectivist principles to read any book as such. I never, there is no principle that includes a proper noun in its definition. There is no principle of do not read books with an N, or do not read books written by someone whose initials are NB, or any. The principle is a broad, broad generalization. So, in regard to reading a particular book, the issue is contextual. The question is, in regard to any book, given your knowledge, what positive value might you gain? And is a sanction of evil involved to your knowledge. Now, in my context, I know that no value is to be gained because I wouldn't believe anything in the book. I would simply consign it all to the status of the arbitrary because I know the individual involved. And I know his moral status, so I would regard supporting that book as immoral if I were to do it. Now, each person has to judge on the basis of his knowledge. If you're a complete newcomer to objectivism, you know nothing whatever, then I would not say you are wrong to read that book. You're, you want to know and you don't, why should you take my word for it? You have to decide uh, on your own. Uh, it, it entirely depends what knowledge is available to you. On the other hand, if you read it on the grounds of, quote, tolerance, I refuse ever to pronounce moral judgment. I am not a pig, I'll eat anything. I will wallow in any muck because I want to show that I'm open-minded and considerate. Then that's immoral no matter what you read. 
So it's a much broader issue than this uh, uh, particular piece of garbage, which I couldn't restrain myself from saying. <laughs> I guess I'll make this the last question because it's 10 after. In the question and answer session of certainty and happiness, that was a Fort Hall talk, you painted a bleak picture of the future based on events and subsequent reactions to the Rushdie book. I just have to interject that Peter Schwartz has forbidden me to paint a bleak picture of the future. <laughs> so that hampers my freedom of speech here. <laughs> Based on this and horror stories from doctors, lawyers, etc., what is your motivation to continue your work, and under what circumstances does one throw in the towel? Well, I'll answer you this way. I have a bleak uh, view of the future, and I, I can't pretend that I don't. I mean, I can't say there's no hope, but I don't have a lot of hope. And one of the things, to show you the extent to which I carry this, you may think this is needlessly apocalyptic, is that in the uh, recent meetings with the publishers, one of the demands that I made to which they agreed is that there's going to be at least 50,000 copies of every one of Ayn Rand's works printed on acid-free paper within the next 10 years. Because I believe that the, you know, the, they're all now, most of it now is on uh, paper with acid, and that paper crumbles after a certain number of decades. And I want the feeling, and it's reached this stage of practicality in my mind, that if civilization does go under, there will be 50,000 copies of each of her works on enduring paper, which I'm going to promptly see are disseminated to the most far out spots in the world, New Zealand and India and Africa and in caves and you name it. Because well, I don't know what will be left if there's an ultimate you know, holocaust, with the hope that one of these 50,000 will be dug up somewhere. So does that qualify as having a bleak view? <laughs> now the question asks, what is your motivation to continue your work? Well, I am doing it primarily selfishly. I am, I have one mission in life, and that is entirely to understand objectivism. I've been doing that full time since I first met Ayn Rand in 1951. That's going on 40 years. And I have not yet entirely achieved my goal. There are still things that I, uh, I started this present book, for instance, in 1984 with the, uh, the idea that I'm just going to edit this series of lectures, at which, after all, Ayn Rand was in attendance, you know, and that I'll just back this out. And in fact, I had a long argument with uh, Edith Packer, who initially insisted that I write this book. She was the first one to insist that I do it. That, that it was pointless and unnecessary, and why waste the time, you know, that I'd already given the lectures. If she, finally, she beat me into submission. And I decided, all right, I'll do it. And I've been on it six years. I have rewritten it, uh, I don't know, at least two major times from scratch, throwing out whole sections, such as the example I gave you on independence. Uh, I have committed, I don't know, a dozen objectively provable errors of varying degrees of severity that I was able to detect for a whole variety of different reasons. There are still obviously things that uh, uh, I want to grasp entirely selfishly. And from that point of view, if I was alone on a desert island, nothing would stop me from finishing this book to the point where I now see entirely clearly the complete system from beginning to end, not in all its applications, but the pure system with a complete integration from the first word about existence to the last word about art. And once I have that, I can die happy on the grounds that it took me 40 years, but I finally have done it. And that is my actual motivation. Now, in the process, as I say, I, I've come up with other ideas of my own. And if I live long enough, since I regard them as elaborations and developments, especially in the field of epistemology, I'm interested in, in pursuing it. But it's really primarily egoistically. That doesn't mean a slight to you in the audience. Obviously, I want the book to be read. 
so on. But that is, the, the real motivation is not uh, the readers and certainly not the money, because I could make much more money lecturing uh, than, than not. But uh, I'm going to lick this one way or the other, and I'm right on the threshold. It's down for the count of nine now. There's just one more uh, count left. It says the questioner here answers, under what circumstances do you throw in the towel? Uh, Ayn Rand's answer to that, which is also mine, is when censorship is imposed. When you no longer are free to publish ideas, when you have to have the government approval, that's the end. Then you have to quit and retire, or you can write for yourself, but then it becomes dangerous even to have it found in your possession. So the test is whether the First Amendment remains applicable or not. That is my test of when I would throw in the towel. Now, I don't expect that. That's going to be very hard for them to put over in this country, really hard. And the threat will come not from the liberals, but from the conservatives. If you notice in the Rushdie affair, it was the liberals, uh, you know, weak as they are, who put up the biggest scream, and the conservatives who you know, were upset about the, quote, blasphemy to a religious creed and threw away as a parenthesis. Of course, it's not nice to commit murder, but still we can understand and sympathize. It's the conservatives who are the danger to freedom of speech, and that's another reason, among many others, why uh, I regard the whole right, the, quote, political right in this country, as much worse and more dangerous than the political left. Uh, I was going to end on a positive note, and I got off on a denunciation, and our time is up. Let me just say, I am, as of this moment, going into 10 months seclusion. I'm not addressing another audience. You are the last people I will see in a public capacity until I get this book done. So I hope you have a great year, and thank you very much for coming. like to say uh, a very few words. Uh, first, that uh, I and TJS uh, entirely agree with everything that Dr. Peacock has said, and I'd just like to note two particular points of special uh, agreement. The analogy that he drew uh, to the Catholic Church, of which I am no supporter, uh, any body of thought has a definite identity, and it is wrong of anyone to present him or herself as a proponent of that body of thought while violating any of its essentials. And uh, secondly, closely related to that, that the violation of any essential of a body of thought nullifies the value of the entire body of thought. It might be that if we bent this or that, we could have a bigger following faster, but it would be worthless because we would achieve nothing but the name and there would be no substance. So I agree fully with the idea that we would be better with two people advocating what is true than two million advocating some diluted version. Thank you. Thank you.